John Bates, who is our speaker this morning and was willing to switch from his Monday uh, original to today, uh, probably a little bit better weather to come down from up north anyway. John is the author of seven books and a contributor to others which focus on the natural history of the North Woods. He's worked as a naturalist in Wisconsin's Northwoods for over 24 years, leading trips designed to help people further understand the diversity and beauty of nature and our place within it. This morning, as you can see by this wonderful cartoon, I don't know if we have any moose like that on in our audience, but uh, John's going to tickle our funny bone this morning. The Big Bang Evolution, Natural Selection, Population Dynamics, Adaptations, Reproductive Strategies, Animal Behavior, Wildlife Management. Here's Wildlife Ecology 101 in 55 minutes through the comic lens of Farside, Kelvin and Hobbes, and others. So let's laugh for a little bit while we learn a little bit on the farthest side of wildlife ecology with John Bates. Good morning, John. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. And uh, Monday it was minus 40 at my house, only minus 30 this morning. So uh, it was <laughs> tropical and much easier to get down here. Uh, so I, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all for, for uh, coming in this morning when it would have been much easier to stay home, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know what it takes to organize one of these events. I've, I've done some of these myself. Uh, but I'm sure you've given a round of applause to Vicki already. But man, she had to rearrange all this stuff. And wow. So, I was feeling sorry for her on, on Monday when she was, I'm sure, losing her mind slowly, or quickly, as the case may be. Uh, what I want to do is run through all kinds of fun cartoons. Hopefully you all are lovers of Gary Larson and Calvin and Hobbes and other folks. Um, uh, I learned a long time ago that science goes over a lot of folks' heads, including mine, and uh, there's lots of ways uh, to teach, to, to try to uh, inculcate different ideas. Uh, and I always try to work through head, hands, and heart, and in this case, maybe through belly, in terms of belly laughing. Uh, uh, environmental literacy is tremendously important. Uh, we all need uh, more and more stewards on, on this planet. And uh, it requires not only love, but it requires literacy and, and an in-depth knowledge of the complexities of the natural world. So this is one way to get at some of those things. We'll just touch on a whole bunch of stuff and hopefully have a hoot doing it. Um, I'm highly interruptible. Actually, the word's not interruptible. Um, if you have good stories or, or funnier jokes than I have, please <laughs> throw them out. Uh, don't, don't hesitate for a second. A synergy is way better than just listening to me drone on for an hour or so. I do respond to blunt and or sharp objects. So if, if, uh, <laughs> if there's something I'm not doing right, just you know, tell me if I'm not going fast enough or the snoring gets too loud, whatever it may be. So I will read uh, the text in case you can't see that on occasion there. It's kind of small. So hopefully you can all see it's the call of the wild. So when we talk about the, the, how the world began, we always talk about the Big Bang Theory. And I, I love this version of it instead. Um, hopefully you can see that God as a kid tries to make a chicken in his room. Uh, that's another, another Big Bang that occurred. Uh, and I, I subscribe to that as probably the way it all worked out. Uh, basic timeline of the Earth. Uh, I'm not trying to get into the arguments about this, but this is just what scientists say. So we're going to spend at least 25 seconds you know, going through <laughs> 3 billion years here. But it's just so fascinating to see this kind of laid out in front of us, how life came to be, and how we are now at the highest point of evolution, all of us as well, at, at this stage. So it all all came through to this point through a process of natural selection, which um, hopefully you can read that, natural selection at work. And this isn't, this isn't a debatable point. Uh, natural selection is, is simply a change over time according to a change in, in characteristics in the environment. Think of resistance to antibiotics or think of uh, resistance in uh, insects or plants to farm herbicides, insecticides, et cetera. It just, it, there's no argument about it. What the argument is about is origins, and, and I don't have any trouble having little tiny words here. Does natural selection or evolution negate the presence of God? I don't wish to debate this. I just, my opinion, for whatever it's worth, and the next cartoon will come quickly, is that the two can very happily coexist, and they do in my mind and heart without any trouble at all, 
And what really matters is treating the world with a deep reverence. Uh, however you come to that, uh, it really matters not. So 65 million years ago, we're, we're running through a few billion very quickly. Uh, the picture is pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world climates are changing, the mammals are taking over, and we all have a brain about the size of a walnut. <laughs> That was a press conference back then, and <laughs> change was coming quickly. And, you know, it wasn't uh, until humans showed up, gosh, whatever that timeline said, 20,000 or so years ago, 200,000, yeah, 200, whatever number you want to use, hunter-gatherer societies. I love this cartoon of Calvin Hobbes. Uh, I think you can read that all for yourselves. I don't romanticize that life particularly. Uh, Calvin obviously was. Mom was setting them straight. Human population really did not grow uh, whatsoever, but uh, here we have criminy. It seems like every summer there's more and more of these things around. Uh, <laughs> human population did grow, but it didn't grow really until the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution, and then it just shot through the through the roof, and I hope you've all seen these kinds of graphs that I think are just stunning. Uh, 2,000 years ago, there was maybe 200 million of us, and then gradually increasing to 1,800s to a billion, and then bang. You know, I was born in 1951, and there was only 3 billion of us, uh, you know, just in my lifetime, and some of you are a little older than me yet. Uh, you know, it's doubled, and then some, and where is it all going to end is, is an interesting question. Uh, we're heading towards the estimates of 9 billion in 2045. One, one, it's an enormous issue, and I just want to throw it out there. As an issue relative to wildlife ecology, the more and more of us there are, the less and less habitat there is for them. It was important over all this time, particularly in hunter-gatherer societies, societies, to be able to identify those things that are out there because some of them could have hurt you. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't have Latin names back then. and, and we're trying to learn how to pronounce the Latin. Uh, Thack, was, Thack was left out of the genetic pool after this particular incident. Uh, but currently we need to give things the dignity of their names, but at the same time, uh, we need not only to identify them and, and properly assign uh, those names, but we also need to look to the heart. And I love this quote by Sally Carragher. I held a blue flower in my hand, probably a blue aster, wondering what its name was, and then thought that human names are superfluous Nature does not name them. The important thing is to know this flower, look at its color, until the blueness becomes as real as a keynote of music. Just a lovely quote. And sometimes I think we, we bypass wildlife and or plants because we've seen them. I've been there, done that kind of thing. Oh, that's just a robin. Oh, that's just an oak tree. Oh, that's just, I've seen that. And I think the key is, uh, an Emerson quote is, uh, the true mark of wisdom is to uh, experience the miraculous and the common every day. And that's, that's something I, I try to do and fail miserably at every day, but always try. So if we're looking at uh, wildlife species, just looking at Wisconsin alone, it's a daunting task to try to even identify them all, much less understand their life histories, much less understand their interactions biotically and abiotically. It's a big, big deal. Particularly if you're going to do insects, I love listening to the Larry Mueller show and, and uh, well, who's that guy that's on... Uh, Phil Pelletier, I've emailed him many times and said, Phil, what in the hell is this that I'm looking at? Somebody sends me a picture of God knows what insect, and I send it to him, and he, he figures it out. Uh, 20,000 to 40,000 species somewhere in that ballpark. It's, what, 3 million to 30 million species, something like that on the earth. No one really knows, in large part because there are so many different insect species that are still trying to be identified. But anyway, quite a number of species just to figure out. I love the fact there's 81 species of mussels alone. And I love the fact there's 700 species of lichens. I don't know if any of you are into lichens, but uh, this, the diversity of the natural world is so stunning and so beautiful to think about, and it, it's just a, a lovely thing to be a part of it. And to, and to poke around and look at this stuff every day and try to learn it uh, is quite a gift, I think, that we're, we've been given. So the requirements of wildlife are food, water, and cover. We all know that from eighth grade biology, but it's really not simple whatsoever because there's all this other stuff that you've got to throw in there, timing and seasonality and competition and cooperation and carrying capacity and all these limiting factors, and we're going to look at a bunch of those. So habitat's the most important word in the wildlife vocabulary. Those are prairie dog developers down there, the guy smoking a cigar. Hopefully <laughs> you can see him. 
the second most uh, important word in, in wildlife uh, managers' vocabulary is exotics, and it wasn't that case, of course, uh, that many years ago, but it has really become to the forefront now. How do I define exotic? Well, oops, I thought I had a, something that was going to end. Exotic would be a, a non-native species, a species that wasn't here prior to European settlement, would be my definition. Well, you're going to be splitting hairs with me. And, uh, uh, well, yeah, and we're, you know, we're exotic species, those of us who came here from Europe. All of us. So uh, um, there's always an interesting discussion and question about how we should approach exotic species, that the world is constantly in flux and in change, um, and there are species moving across habitats. The question is, when we introduce an, a species that is from another place that has no competitors and it becomes uh, an invasive, not all exotic species are invasive by any means, but those that become invasive become quite problematic for us. So I threw this slide in here just because it was fun. <laughs> Average minimum j January temperature. You can't really see the chart, just kind of blurred out, but uh, the dark charcoal is zero to minus two is supposed to be our average minimum January temperature. I threw this chart on here just to show you that the diversity within Wisconsin is in large part due to temperature variation. Uh, down at the very bottom, when you get into that green, that uh, is at uh, six to eight, if I'm not mistaken, or eight to 10 anyway. And at the very bottom down there by Racine and Kenosha, you're looking at uh, 10 to 12. So as you drive down Highway 51, you're all very well aware that you're changing habitat as you go along. And here's what it looks like on an early vegetation Wisconsin map. And it's not just as simple as temperature. It's about soil. It's about a variety of things. But uh, the Northwoods was, had a great, great deal of variation in it based on soil. But as you head south and you head through Wausau and this whole, hopefully you're familiar with the tension zone here that runs through central Wisconsin that differentiates northern species from southern species as a general rule, this kind of melting place where they come together is right in this area. And you get down into the prairie country. So temperature matters and it matters to wildlife because the, the, uh, obviously the, the plant communities are what, de what determines what wildlife will be there. Oh, where are all the animals supposed to live now that they cut down these woods to put in houses? By golly, how would people like it if animals bulldozed the suburb and put in new trees? <laughs> no good, they didn't leave the keys. <laughs> I, I love that look on their faces there in that bottom. I mean, it's like, this is a revelation. <laughs> We're going to bulldoze the suburb and put in trees. I like that cartoon. Probably has nothing to do with anything, but I just wanted to put it in there. So when we're talking about food cover and, and water, uh, food has to have a variety of different uh, qualities to it. It has to be the right kind. If you're thinking about deer, since a lot of folks think about deer, well, the reason we have so many balsam trees in the northern forest is because deer hate balsam. They, deer can have their bellies full of balsam and starve to death simultaneously. They love cedar and hemlock, so they, they are uh, selectors of the understory species within our uh, Northwoods. Um, it has to be the right quality. So, uh, is it the fresh bite right at the tip? Is it something older? Is it fat versus sugar in terms of, sh of fruits that are on a, on a plant for a bird to utilize? Is it the right quantity? Is it coming at the right time uh, during migration when you need more? During gestation when you need more? Is it the right interspersion of all that food? Is it within that home range? Is it just outside so that it exposes you to predation? Is it reachable? There's all these characteristics, and it changes with season. It's not simple how all this food has to be available in the right way, in the right time, in the right quantity. Oops, I forgot the cartoon. Did everybody see what it said? Nope, nope, I don't like that at all. Too many legs. Yes, the invertebrate taste test. Yeah. The question that comes up a lot of times that always appalls me is what good is something? And uh, that to me is a, is a height of arrogance of us as human beings. Uh, here's a bunch of birds saying, let's see, mosquitoes, gnats, flies, ants, what the, those jerks, we didn't order stink bugs on this thing. Well, so here's the birds saying, you know, what good are stink bugs? Uh, uh, I've been at many a, a wildlife meeting and or conservation meeting where people will say, what good are eagles? What good are sturgeon? What good are this? I don't eat them. Those kind of things make me crazy because uh, everything's good. I mean, it's all here uh, over these millions of years of evolution, and we have to assume that everything has a purpose and has an interaction that has some, some value. Our task is to try to figure what that is. 
So it's a matter of all this coevolution. We talk so much about competition, but coevolution is huge. What good are mosquitoes? I always get asked that one, and particularly this last summer, which was just hellacious with mosquitoes. Um, you can see, pull out, pull out, Betty, you've hit an artery. Have any of you ever done that when one's biting you and then you kind of pinch your skin and watch it blow up? That's very, very exciting. Very exciting thing to do. It, it gets junior high kids interested in mosquitoes. Uh, but pollination, what's the uh, greatest uh, uh, source of pollination in the Arctic? Uh, male mosquitoes. They're the most important pollinator up there. And mosquitoes are very important for wildness. My goodness, Harold, now there goes one big mosquito. <laughs> Indeed. A good friend of mine said that uh, mosquitoes have kept more land in, in wild status than any legislation will ever do. And, and so I, I, I agree. It really does. Uh, last summer was a good indication as well. A lot of people didn't go into the woods because it was pretty intense out there and, and it kept things pretty wild. What about feeding wildlife? Since we're talking about food, there's lots of problems with feeding wildlife. I like this. It's Bob, all right. Look at those vacuous eyes, that stupid grin on his face. He's been domesticated, I tell you. You know, that's, that's one of the issues with feeding deer or feeding any other animal is we, we risk the semi-domestication uh, of that critter. We, ex we risk exceeding carrying capacity. We risk creating dependency. We risk altering seasonal movements. We risk increasing disease transmittal. There's a variety of trade-offs in our joy in looking at things. I'm an avid bird feeder, and I question myself all the time, frankly, if I should be doing that, but I can't give it up because I like it so much. Um, and there's less effects, I think, on feeding deer than there may be on feeding, um, feeding birds, that is, compared to feeding deer. And we don't want to get into that lovely controversy. But <laughs> let's talk about water, the same issues, right quality, right quantity, right timing, right interspersion. And I love to talk about floods because floods are good. Not, not floods that are once in a lifetime, once in a century ones, but the yearly kind of moderate flood because they do these things. A fire, we've all accepted that fire is a good thing for wildlife. It's a good thing for the natural world in general. Same is true of floods. They scour the stream bottom, the silt. Uh, those, those eggs down on the bottom need to, need to be clean, not be covered by silt because they have to breathe. They have to take in oxygen. Uh, it saturates wetlands so that when you have a drought in the spring, I'm sorry, in the summer, those wetlands can, are a sponge and they slowly release water. All those things I have up there are terribly important. Floods are, are essential and when we create dams, we alter those uh, natural values and alters all kinds of uh, habitat and behaviors of wildlife. Let's talk about cover, same deal, kind, quality, quantity, interspersion, timing, et cetera, et cetera. Now here's a feature you folks would really enjoy. Voila, a tree right off the master bedroom. <laughs> yeah. So cover provides all of these different uh, uh, important essential kinds of, of factors in terms of where can you escape and or hide, where do you go to breed and, and or spawn, where do you go to den and or nest, etc. All those things all are covered and more within cover and that changes again with season. Changes with season. So the habitats that we have to provide for wildlife have to have this variability within them. Clean it up, clean it up, criminy it's supposed to be a rat hole. <laughs> I love that. That's a, that's a, that gives the excuse for all of us who don't clean things very well. It's supposed to be. Uh, cleanliness is not next to godliness. I hate to in inform all of you who believe that. Uh, the commercials and or advertisements I see in, in local papers for German forestry make me a little crazy because we're not supposed to clean things up. Clean your kitchen cupboards. That's fine. But do not clean out the woods. All of that downed... Uh, uh, wood on the forest floor, all of that random chaos out there is the way it's supposed to be. It matters. It's supposed to be that way in our lakes. All the trees that fall into that water are supposed to stay there and not be pulled out. Dead and dying trees provide an amazing and incredibly important uh, array of habitat. And just a couple examples. One of my favorite uh, songbirds is this little warbler called an oven bird. Hopefully you've all heard it in the spring. It goes, teacher, 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 teacher. 
or easier to remember, oven bird, pizza, 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 pizza. Because <laughs> you put the pizza in the oven, you get that. So anyway, the oven bird nests on the forest floor. And if, if the forest floor is cleaned up, where, where do you have cover? Where do you tuck your nest in so that any animal or any other pred- predatorial bird won't just simply come down and steal your eggs? You've got to have cover. Hermit thrush, hopefully you've all heard the song of a hermit thrush. I should have put the song in the, in the slideshow. I forgot. The typical song lasts perhaps two seconds. It's an ascending call, ethereal, beautiful, heavenly song. Includes 45 to 100 notes, 25 to 50 pitch changes. And I love this quote, a musical microcosm, the highest summit in the evolution of animal music. If you get a chance, there's some neat tapes out there that slow down some of these songs, slow down the hermit thrush, slow down the winter wren, and it's just astonishing the number of, of, uh, of notes that are compressed into these short songs. Hermit thrush nests on the ground. Calvin and Hobbes, I love this one, uh, just about random chaos. In this case, they just got a leaf pile. Now, where did all the bed pillows go? This is going to be soft. And he leaps in and he says, hey, Hobbes, come on, jump in the leaves. It's fun. I don't know. Sometimes slugs hide under leaves. No, they don't. Do they? Slugs? Ugh. Just imagine one of those slimy muck balls slipping up your pant leg. There might be dozens in there. There might? Ah! That's the problem with nature. Some things always stinging you or oozing mucus on you. Let's go watch TV. Is it 3 o'clock yet? We can watch the blob. Yeah. <laughs> and this is an issue, of course, is that random chaos on the forest floor creates things like slugs and other slimy, oozy kinds of things that are... That, uh, most of us don't know the names of them and have little appreciation for it, but of course are part of that evolutionary cycle and belong there. And one of the hard things for all of us, including myself, is to learn to look small, to, uh, to take our time, poke around, and, and look at those things, put them under a microscope, and they're really fascinating, and try to learn what they do. Here's why we need to maintain old trees and standing dead trees. 32 reasons. These are all cavity nesting birds in Wisconsin. That if you do not have dead trees, if you do not allow disease to occur in your forest, uh, Leopold has a wonderful essay on, on the value of disease. And I think it's in, in November in his uh, San County Almanac. But if you have just, for instance, chickadees, chickadees nest in cavities. You will not have chickadees come into your feeder if you do not have cavities, old dead standing trees that they can nest in. Same thing for nuthatches, both white-breasted and red-breasted nest in cavities. I love this bird, brown creeper. It nests behind loose bark. That's where it's adapted to go. So when that bark starts, starts sloughing off and we think, oh, that's a diseased tree, we better cut that thing down. That's a, as my uh, mother-in-law, bless her soul, I loved her, uh, would say, that's so messy, John. Get that. Why don't you get rid of that? And I'm like, well, <laughs> Mom, <laughs> all these things live there. And, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, one summer, many years ago, I worked for the uh, United States Forest Service, and we were cutting down weed trees so that the uh, conifers could grow. Yes. Is that wrong? Uh, <laughs> or was that wrong? <laughs> weed, you say weed trees. Uh, popple. Yeah. Uh, anything, anything that wasn't a conifer. Yeah. Well, everything's a trade-off. There's pros and cons, as you, as you know, as a forester, you, you knew that, that you're going to, no matter what you do, you're, one thing, it's like, it's like if you're an engineer, you design, by designing in one thing, you design out something else. So it's a decision that, that you were trying to uh, take advantage of some coniferous aspect that you wanted there. And that's a choice everybody makes. I, I walk people's property and, and help them understand what species they have and talk about management options. And it's, all, it's a lot of guesswork for one, but it's also just a value system in, in that case. Was it wrong? I can't say that it depended on what you guys were trying to, to create. There's a lot of attempts in Wisconsin to recreate white pine habitat because we had so many white pines. And, and Was it white pine? Yeah. And so... There's a lot of value to that. We diminished it to such an extent that we had very little seed source left, and in came all the popple after, after the cutover and, all the, and, the, and the fires. There wasn't any real source of white pine seed, and, and so what's our obligation in that case? Do we, do we, and, and how much is too much and how much is too little? We get into those incredible questions, and, and that's the joy of, of doing both wildlife and, and uh, terrestrial forest management. American Martin's Den and Old Big Trees. Uh, an endangered species in Wisconsin. Pileated woodpeckers are the condo developers of the Northwoods. 
and, and the central woods. Um, you know, and they eat a ton of insects. Uh, somebody opened up the stomach of one of these guys, had 2,000 carpenter ants in the stomach of one pileated woodpecker. So are they, they're our best natural insecticide. Uh, I had a professor in, in college who always said uh, about woodpeckers, eat, eat an insect a day, I'm sorry, let's see, he said, eat in winter an insect a day, eat a thousand in May. By eating those in, in winter, you're killing those thousand that would have come out in May. So keeping these woodpeckers on your property in those dead and dying trees, it's a balanced thing. Is it, is it good to have everywhere dead? No, of course not. There's always this, this balance. Everything about our lives, personal lives, everything about the natural world is this ephemeral balance. And, and the really difficult question is to figure out what that is and how to kind of generally maintain that. Great research study on coarse woody habitat in lakes that was done by the UW Trout Lake uh, world-class limnology lab uh, up on two lakes just north of Manaqua. They removed on one of the lakes, they, they divide the lakes in half on, on uh, Little Rock Lake. It had all kinds of coarse woody debris all along the shoreline. They removed on half of it all of that coarse woody debris and left it on the other half. And on the case of Camp Lake, it was a wilderness lake but had very little trees having fall, fallen down into the lake. In that case, they got a bunch of graduate students who cut down a whole bunch of trees, and on half of the lake, they put all these trees into the water during the winter. And what they did is pre-measure uh, uh, fish life and insect life and determine then after the fact how that altered things. And, and uh, what happened in particular was on Little Rock Lake, they, they, uh, they bombed out the yellow perch population. They completely died out because on the, on the half that they'd removed the coarse woody debris from, and then the bass that were eating the uh, yellow perch uh, started to starve, and they started to cannibalize one another. And then what they found, because they were going out every week and capturing some of the bass, and they would open the stomachs and, and, and check out what they'd been eating. What they found then was that the main uh, pre predatory source of food for them was uh, rodents, which I thought was just fascinating. They were starving so much, they were really eating one another, or they're laying up on the shoreline waiting for some poor mouse to come down and take a drink of water out of the lake, and then somehow capturing it. But anyway, uh, really excellent research for why do we need to leave all of that, those trees when they fall in the lake are habitat. They'll be there for hundreds of years and they provide cover for all kinds of small fish. And if you're a small fish, you know, a weed's a plant without a press agent and, and <laughs> you want all that stuff. That's not weeds to you, that's cover. And it's terrible for when we swim because it's, you know, it's all around our legs and ooh, you know. But uh, you gotta think like a fish. Um, and that's hard for us sometimes. Think like a bird, think, you know, you gotta walk in their moccasins or walk in their gills or, I don't know, I can't, that's poor, uh, the analogy won't fly. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's an underwater prairie out there and we need to, we need to acknowledge that and, rec and, and value it. I love always the quote, the nature abhors a va vacuum, winners and losers as habitat changes, what we were talking about, nature's dynamic. The woods were dark and foreboding, and Alice sensed that sinister eyes were watching her every step. Worst of all, she knew that nature abhorred a vacuum. <laughs> this may be my favorite uh, cartoon of all. I love Alice out there vacuuming away with a raven kind of, you know, ready to pounce. That's great. Anyway, um, and hopefully you're all familiar with niches. We always call them niches. Now people call them niches. I don't know, niche, niche, potato, potato. It's the role or function of profession of whatever it is, a plant or an animal. What does it do? Uh, there can't be more bears than there are bear jobs as such, you know. <laughs> you call this a niche? A niche? Well, yeah, that's, yeah, okay. So the most successful species are those that are opportunistic species. They're the most adaptable ones. Here's the bears looking at one another saying, come on, look at these fangs, look at these claws. You think we're supposed to eat just honey and berries? <laughs> hmm. You know, I, I get in discussions with people all the time about predators and about wolves in particular and, and bears, but more about wolves. And I always say the, the big surprise to me, the big question is, isn't whether a wolf will eat you, it's why don't they? Why don't they? We're fat, we're slow, we're corn fed, you know? <laughs> I think we'd taste great and how easy it would be to just take us all out. What are they waiting for? You know? And they don't. That's astonishing. Why don't they? Anyway, I think it's a fascinating question. If anybody has an answer, see me afterwards. I'd love to know, but no one I've ever brought that up to has. 
an answer. But anyway, the least successful species are those that are specialists, and here's some examples. Well, here's a generalist. The best generalist of all is the American robin. Uh, look at its breeding habitat, all of North America. When we were in the redwood forest, when we were in uh, uh, well, just anywhere, down in uh, uh, southern Arizona in, in deserts, all doing bird watching, here are robins everywhere. Uh, up in the sequoias, here are robins. They're, just, they're in suburban backyards. They're the best adaptable, uh, non-specialist, opportunistic feeder there is. And then we have all these specialists who, because they, do, they have a narrow niche, narrow niche that they, they occupy, uh, they have difficulty surviving, piping plover being one. Uh, the Kirtland warbler needs the jack pines that are 5 to 20 years old and without, because they nest underneath that, that low-hanging uh, branch environment of, of those conifers. And if they get older than that, uh, they start self-pruning. Anyway, um, very specialist, uh, very much specialist, and therefore not very uh, dominant on the landscape. Then we have this whole aspect of predator-prey relationships. Uh, I always throw out the fact about bears, because deer are always a big deal. Deer eat, bears eat a lot of fawns. Impolite as they were, the other bears could never help staring at Larry's enormous deer gut. Yes. <laughs> It'll take off on the beer gut there. How many bears are too many bears? How many deer are too many or too few? Lord knows. Wonderful questions. Merlin, I get great phone calls from people saying, I've got this little hawk or falcon that's on my, near my bird feeder. It's beautiful. So I don't know what it is. And they describe it to me. We go through it and we say, oh, it's a Merlin. Oh, I've never seen one. It's so incredible. Wow. Oh, what does it eat? Well, it eats your goldfinch and it eats your chickadees. <laughs> and it eats your nut hatches. And it'll eat every songbird at your feeder. Oh, well, how do I get rid of it then? You know? And so we, we go from this height of joy to this depth of despair of what do we do about this? this predator. Double-crested cormorants on average eat a pound of fish a day. Well, in 2011, there were 12,000 plus nests over, in particular, on Green Bay. It's a big issue over there. Is that too many? What right do they have to the fish? Uh, I always kick, I get a kick out of when people say, those are my fish. <laughs> those are my deer. Really? Those are. Okay. Uh, carrying capacity, the upper limit of a population that a habitat can support. You think of your kitchen, how much food's in your cupboards. That's, that's your carrying capacity. And then all the aspects of cover and other things that you don't really have to worry about, hopefully in your house too much, but in terms of food, carrying capacity. And there's all these limiting factors, which is the law of the minimum, the maximum, any condition that nears or surpasses the limits of tolerance. So is it too cold or is it too warm? Uh, a professor of mine always said it was too cold down in Madison for white pine to live. We all looked at him like, what? what's he talking about? He was always doing this to us. He was such a great professor for always screwing around with us like that. It was too cold down in Madison for white pine to survive. Well, why? Well, it's because uh, there isn't as much snow cover to insulate the soil and the, and the roots would freeze compared to up here. Even though it's colder up here by temperature, it really matters how much snow cover there is. So there's, there's minimums and maximums and there's lots of different variability in this. Is there too little, too much phosphorus, nitrogen? Is there too, you know, how much stopover habitat? What's the quality of that when you're migrating? All this kind of stuff. And then we have social carrying capacity, which is what we've run into with wolves in particular, and with deer to a certain extent, where these high uh, uh, profile species have, it, it, is, it isn't a biological issue anymore. It becomes a social issue where we have different fears or concerns that, that uh, drive what we do, or, or different political analysis, as the case may be, which we definitely don't want to go into. Keystone species are those species uh, that alter the habitat far beyond their numbers. Here's a beaver. No, he's not that busy. In fact, the whole thing is just a myth. <laughs> you know, what do beavers do all winter long hanging out in that lodge? I mean, they're, they're reading the paper, I guess. I, I don't know what they're doing. Five months sitting in a lodge with like six young and your wife? Holy man, think about that. <laughs> it's dark and it's, you know, wow. You could probably learn a whole lot about fam family dynamics, the good stuff from talking to beavers because they get along somehow. Anyway, a research study on some pristine rivers in Canada showed that beavers build on average 17 dams per mile. That's a beaver lodge I have there, but dams per mile. And if you know, you remember 1,760 yards per mile, that's a dam every 100 yards. In, in natural settings. And this great quote where beaver remain largely unexploited, 
they may influence 20 to 40 percent, so a third of the total length of second to fifth order streams, which are most of the regular rivers that we would know about with the alterations remaining a part of the landscape for centuries. So that's what I mean by a keystone species, an individual species like us, that alters habitat far beyond its numbers would indicate. What good are beaver? Well, they create beaver ponds. What lives on beaver ponds? Well, all kinds of things, including wood ducks, and teal, and, and uh, uh, herons, so forth and so on. So it's one of these trade-offs. Again, uh, if you're a trout fisherman, you hate beaver. Uh, because they're, you're warming up a river system and you're, you're removing that cold water species. On the other hand, you're creating bird habitat. Trade-offs, always trade-offs. By the way, wow, isn't that incredible? God or evolution, whoever conspired to make this bird just went overboard. <laughs> just a miracle of a bird. Holy man. Deer are the other keystone species, and they do have a split personality. They're a grazer in the summer and a browser in the winter. I love that uh, white buck down there, one of the photos of Jeff Richter's in his white deer book. Deer eat five pounds of woody browse a day in the winter. So they eat cereal three, four months out of the year. They eat the box the other eight months. <laughs> And here's a deer exclosure up in Boulder Junction. Um, and uh, hopefully you can guess which side the deer are allowed on. It's not, this isn't, you know, rocket science. This is deer. This is what deer do. And what deer don't do if they're not in the habitat. Now we need some deer. They belong here. What's the appropriate balance? Any botanist or forester will tell you we have far too many. Most hunters will tell you we don't have enough. It's an interesting balance that we're all trying to figure out. Deer and edge species, you build younger forests with lots of edge, they'll thrive, which is exactly what we've done and continue to do as more people get on the planet. If we build older forests, they'll leave, but that's not totally true because in winter they need older forests for cover. I just put this one in here because I love this. His rifle poised, Gus burst through the door, stopped and listened, nothing but the gentle sound of running water and the rustling of magazines could be heard. The trail apparently had been false. <laughs> and I hope you can see the hooves right there. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything. I just liked it very much. Uh, and I like this one equally. Bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> Deer cause trophic cascades. Oh man, I gotta hurry. Uh, we have a whole lot of ground nesting birds. 33 species of birds nest on the ground. Most of you know about grouse or wild turkey nesting on the ground, but all kinds of, of uh, uh, warblers and oh, all these birds, they all nest on the ground. And deer cause trophic cascades by eating all of that vegetation, that understory vegetation and denuding that, these guys no longer have any cover. It's a major issue. Let's talk about trophic cascades. Uh, this was a great study. I, I don't know how many of you ever heard about this one. The DNR wanted to clean up Lake Mendota, pretty polluted lake. If you've all been down to Madison, I'm sure you've seen Lake Mendota, big, big algal, algal blooms every summer. So what they decided to do was the way they were going to clean up the lake was they were going to increase the walleye population, which makes a total, total sense, and it worked. It was a trophic cascade, and they introduced over 2 million walleye fingerlings over the course of 12 years, and what they wanted to do was this by, I need four people, four volunteers real quick. Can I have four people up here super fast? Just stand up right here. This gentleman is phytoplankton. He's an, he's an algae, I'm sorry. There's a phytoplankton. This is those little guys that when you were in ninth grade biology, you looked at them, they were swimming all around, all those little, little uh, zooplankton. This is a small fish. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. There's a small fish, so he's a minnow. And then I need a walleye. Who wants to be a walleye? Who wants to be my walleye? <laughs> Okay, these are the populations of these, of these critters. Okay, so if we increase the population of the walleye that eats small fish, you go down. So just go down. Sit. No, no, you can't sit. <laughs> he goes down. By him going down, you eat zooplankton. You go up. What do you eat? Algae phytoplankton. He goes down. Does that make sense? Well, that's a trophic cascade. It worked. Thank you very much, you guys. <laughs>
Okay, so does that make, that make sense, right? It worked. The only thing that didn't work is they forgot to tell the walleye fishermen not to take all the walleye out. And that became a major issue because the walleye fishermen thought, oh man, we've hit paradise, we're gonna kill every walleye in sight. And they pretty much did. But they did clean up the water there for a while by increasing that. So that's what a trophic cascade is, that if you take something at one end of the, of the food chain, it's going to affect something at the very other end. And it's fun to try to tease this stuff out. Um, and there's trophic cascades relative to, to timber wolves. And this has been proven out in the West. It's a curious consideration in Northwoods. I'm not exactly sure how it plays out in the Northwoods, but I love this quote by Leopold, and I'll read it if you don't mind. I have lived to see state after state extirpate its wolves. I have watched the face of many a newly wolfless mountain and seen the south-facing slopes wrinkle with a maze of new deer trails. I have seen every edible bush and seedling browsed, I misspelled that, browsed, first to anemic de desitude and then to death. I have seen every edible tree defoliated to the height of a saddle horn. Such a mountain looks as if someone had given God a new pruning shears and forbidden him all other exercise. In the end, the starved bones of the hoped-for deer herd, dead of its own too much, bleached with the bones of the dead sage or molder under the high-lined junipers. I now suspect that just as a deer herd lives in mortal fear of its wolves, so does a mountain live in mortal fear of its deer. So predators need prey and prey need predators. It's not linear, it's not simple, it's complicated and it changes from year to year, but it's necessary. So let's look at the trophic cascade that happened out in Yellowstone Park when they introduced wolves back into Yellowstone. Very controversial, a lot of people very angry about it because they were eating elk. And there were a lot of elk hunters and ranchers that were concerned about the wolves eating some of their animals as well. Well, the wolves ate and chased the elk. And when we get all upset about wolves eating all of our deer here, mostly they're chasing our deer and making them more fit, which is what they're supposed to do. Um, not, make, not allowing them to remain semi-domesticated. They are moving them around. And that's what the wolves were doing out there. They were eating, they were definitely eating some elk quite a few, and they were chasing them. So the elk are browsers, just like deer, and the best browse was along river systems, and the high populations of elk had browsed the riverbanks down to just about nothing. Wolves began killing the elk and moving around, fewer elk, more active elk, resulted in less browsing along the riverbanks. All these plants started growing back, understory herbaceous plants, shrubs, and trees. The canopy grew, and suddenly there were beavers back in the river. There were birds in the understory and in the overstory, and the bison population increased. Wow, that's a trophic cascade. Really, really elegant, really elegant. So I love this chart uh, about rabbits uh, <laughs> and why we need predators. Hopefully you've all um, seen these kind of, uh, uh, anyway, we'll just do it. If a rabbit has five young per litter per year, there's two litters per year, so there's 10 young per year. Real quick, let's look at a beginning population of 10. There's five breeding pairs, just go down the column. They have 50 offspring, five pairs have 10 young. So there's 60 in the total population. Year two, we have 60 in the breeding population, 30 pairs. They have 300 offspring. That's 360 in the total population. I don't know if, I'm going fast because I'm running out of time, but we end up after the third year with 180 pairs who have 180 off, 1,800 offspring. Now it's up to 2,160. 1,080 pairs who have 10,800 young. Now we're at 12,960. We have 6,480 pairs who now have 64,800 young. We now have 77,760. This is called exponential growth, right? And by the sixth year, we have 77,000 individuals. We have 38,000 pairs. We have 388,000 young. And now we have a half million rabbits. Hot dog. What a deal. <laughs> Do we need predators? <laughs> yeah. Do we need disease? Yeah. Yeah. Death's part of the deal, and we have to get okay with death. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't feel good about death. I don't like seeing death, but I have to intellectually get there and recognize it and live with it and work with it as someone who cares about natural environments, and so do all of us. We have to understand a certain number of trees have to die for other trees to live, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, it's all about balance. Population dynamics is all about Natality, how many young and how many will die over time, a small young gambit, very many small, no parenting. Of course, long before you mature, most of you will be eaten. It's a <laughs> nice thing to say to your kids. Um, and we have lots of examples, uh, a snapping turtle and painted turtles laying lots of eggs. 95% of those nests are dug up and, and eaten before they ever get a chance to hatch, so it's fairly miraculous we have any turtles on the landscape. 
Frogs do the exact same thing. Here's toad eggs. And, you know, so they're creating hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of young in hopes that three or whatever will survive. I love this. Fly dates. Are those her lips? Maybe those other doohickeys are her lips. <laughs> oh, God, he's looking for my lips. I don't know if that's a problem for insects. I, I, I worry about that for them. So same deal with insects. Here's dragonflies. Here's the uh, you know, dragonfly laying eggs. But here's the mayfly hatch in La Crosse on July 25th. That's the radar that night. It looked like a thunderstorm. Have you ever been in a mayfly hatch where there are literally millions of mayflies? Holy man. It's really something. Really something. So that's the small young gambit. That's the approach that hopefully... Some mayflies will, well, the, the adults won't survive, but some young will get born out of that. The large young gambit is to have very few young. That's what we do. Take care of them a long time and hope they get a job and <laughs> go away, you know? And there's lots of variation on that. Uh, uh, you can have more litters like rabbits do. You can have a shorter gestation period or longer. You can have a greater length before you'd start breeding. Muskrats breed in that first year. They're born and breed that same year. You could be polygamous, monogamous. You know, there's all kinds of ways to do all this reproductive stuff. Vera, come quick. Some nature show is a hidden camera in the Erickson's burrow. We're going to see their entire courtship behavior. <laughs> so courtship is all about trying to determine fitness, and the, and the females have all the power, which all of us guys have known forever. Anyway, uh, they choose that male through the courtship uh, displays as who is the most vigorous and who the, is the most fit and therefore will uh, ensure that she has the best young. I'm not sure how this fits in, but oh, Ginger, you look absolutely stunning and whatever you rolled in sure does stink. <laughs> you know? Do not try this line on your wife or, or husband. <laughs> won't, won't work. Avian courtship, you know, it's so fun to watch all these different courtship things. Well, here we are, my little chickadee. I, I like that. <laughs> Their behavior, song, color, they're all used to increase nesting success by choosing the most vigorous mate. And it's also to introduce or, or, or to reduce injury between competing adults. Great study done on... Uh, a red-winged blackbirds and how they can cover up the epaulet on their, on their shoulders, as it were, uh, and how they don't really engage in much combat. What they do is they display that red, and who's ever got the biggest badge, who's ever, you know, wins that territory. And they've done all kinds of cool studies where the one that won this territory, they capture it, then they cover up a bit of the badge, and then these birds come in and just kick him out. He wasn't the most vigorous, as it turned out. He just had the best color. As, as such. So, and then have you ever watched red-winged blackbirds come to your feeder and they'll, they'll completely cover it and that way they won't have a competitive interaction? They're like, okay, yeah, everything's cool. Everything's cool, man. I'm, I'm just here to eat. Don't, you know, don't whack me kind of thing. So they can uncover, cover, depending upon what they, what they want to have happen. It's a very short version of those studies. It's problems with studying courtship when ornithologists are mutually attracted. <laughs> I've seen this in many a tavern. It's, it's a, <laughs> you know, and there's all this stuff about you know, learn, how do animals learn their language and you know, parsing the, the sentence beginning duck. So some is innate and some's learned. I love brown thrashers. They're, they're, the most, they're the best songster apparently in the entire world. They have over 2,000 song variations, all of which they learn. They can, they can mimic a chainsaw. They can mimic all kinds of cool stuff. And then we have a bird like the least flycatcher who doesn't learn anything. He has one song, and that's what he does. Chebec, 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 chebec. <laughs> Works for him. <laughs> Lewis, phone call. <laughs> I, I, I just like that. That's just phone call. Anyway. Any, yeah, so animal communication. This, too, is one of my favorite. Donning his new canine decoder, Professor Schwartzman becomes the first human being on Earth to hear what barking dogs are actually saying. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Maybe that's all they're saying, you know? Who, who knows? 
Maybe they're discussing Shakespeare. We, who knows? <laughs> Wonderful mystery. Let's talk winter super. I got to be done in like two minutes. So I'm going to really fly through here. You can migrate, adapt, or die. Here we are last summer going south. Wait a minute, Irene. We went north last summer at the stupid slides and backwards. <laughs> so <laughs> winter is our greatest limiting factor for all species. And you know we have all these behavioral adapt adaptations to winter. Well, once again, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Great, great choice. Whoops, sorry. Physical adaptations, and please let mom, dad, Rex, Ginger, Tucker, and me, and all the rest of the family see color. Yeah, see <laughs> yeah. Just poor dogs. So I'm just going to run through a bunch of, because you guys got to take your break here. Okay, so migratory behaviors. Okay, everyone, we'll be departing for Antarctica in about 15 minutes. If anyone thinks he may be in the wrong migration, let us know now. <laughs> I think some of you are dressed up like that one there in the middle, <laughs> wishing that you were that guy right now. The bar-tailed godwit does this incredible migration, flies 7,000 miles nonstop, starts in Alaska, flies all the way to New Zealand without stopping. How do they know that? Well, there's no islands along the flight path. They, they put uh, the transmitters on them. And plus, they don't swim anyway, you know, so it doesn't help to land on the water. How do they do that? Well, it's a miraculous physiological interaction that doesn't matter, but I mean, birds go to an extraordinary ends to migrate. It's really a pretty miraculous thing. Navigation's equally miraculous. <laughs> and I'm just going to, I think I just have to blow through some of this stuff. Navigation includes uh, all these amazing things, using the moon, using the sun, using the stars, using wind and magnetic fields, and all these, all these factors. So the hummingbird shows up at your feeder right around Mother's Day every May and taps on the window if you don't have that feeder out, right? How does it do that? How does it do that? That is a stunning, stunning achievement. What do we really know about animal intelligence? I love this. Colonel Sanders at the pearly gates. <laughs> Not something you want to discover too late in life. <laughs> Emotions in animals, testing whether fish have feelings. One, two, testing. Hey, you little bug-eyed, greasy sardine, let me tell you something about your sister, et cetera. So are there, you know, there's a fish study in England which shows that fish do have emotions. Interesting enough, can feel pain. I love this on humans and wildlife. My, what was that? Um, <laughs> Kind of reverse roles here a little bit. Human consciousness, I'll tell you what this means, Norm. No size restrictions and screw the limit. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when we do single species management. We kind of forget about the rest of the world, but what happens everywhere else doesn't matter. I just want more whatever. I want more deer, I want more musky, I want more, 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 whatever it is. Single species management is a loser. Even if it's single species for an endangered species, it's not the way you got to do it. Hey, what happened to the trees here? Who cleared out the woods? There used to be lots of animals in these woods. Now it's a mud pit. This sign says, future site of Shady Acres condominiums. Animals can't afford condos. Shady Acres, the only shade I see is from that bulldozer. <laughs> yeah. Wildlife management, he's trying to shoot me, all right. Do I know this guy? I've got to think. So the, <laughs> they adapt. See how the vegetation has been trampled down? Trample flat here, Jimmy, that tells me where a deer bedded down for the night. After a while, you'll develop an eye for these things yourself. <laughs> How to win a doe. <laughs> Little picture on the tree with his, you know, you know. Forestry management, you know what I'm saying? Me, for example, I couldn't work in some stuffy little office. The outdoor just calls me. So we impact uh, habitats and, and wildlife impact uh, foresters, for, forestry as well. Invasive species, how poodles first came to North America. I, I like that. See the poodles in the, in the uh, banana thing there? All those French poodles. How'd they get here anyway, those French poodles? Uh, native species versus non-natives. And then go back to that cartoon of I don't like that all, too many legs. And I wanted to point out this book, I really highly recommend it about planting native species wherever you live and how it sustains wildlife with native plants because things have co-evolved over all those years. And na non-native plants, our insects are not adapted to. They can't, by and large, cannot eat. And if you don't have insects, you don't have birds. And you don't have birds, you don't have mammals, et cetera, et cetera, all that food chain stuff. Not enough time to read it all. 
But uh, a land without insects is a land without most forms of higher life. Uh, we need native plants. If you're planting anything on your property, try to make sure it belongs here, because it matters. Climate change. This is it, Jenkins' indisputable proof that the Ice Age caught these people completely off guard. <laughs> I'm almost done. I promise I'll be done in well, like two minutes here, Max. So, uh, you know, climate change has lots of controversy, but I adhere to the precautionary principle, which is, you know, look before you leap. Caution practice in the context of uncertainty. If we think there's enormous potential impacts, we need to be cautious. Who's really in control? Acts of God, mystery and randomness. <laughs> all knowledge unfolds, all mystery unfolds knowledge. I love that quote. And where the real work is getting done and where we understand so little. Hey, I got news for you, sweetheart. I am the lowest form of life on earth. <laughs> yeah. So again, we're talking about looking small. This is looking real small. Well, I got good news and bad good news. And hopefully you can see the bad GNU right there with the tongue sticking out. See? <laughs> and that is that I'm done. Uh, the last slide is I lead all kinds of trips. I just love this slide. And those are pictures of satisfied clients. Four out of five would go with us again. I must say, that fifth guy doesn't look too enthused. The autopsy photo doesn't do him justice. <laughs> uh, you know, Mary and I always think it's good if we get 90% of the people back. We think that's a, that's a good rate. So I'm done. Thank you so much for sitting through all of this. Thank you, John.